Hello, and thanks for taking some time to listen to my presentation, The Great Outdoor Reset, Outdoor Citizens and Outdoor Cities Leading the Way Toward a Net Zero World. My name is John Judge. I'm president and CEO of the Appalachian Mountain Club. So what is The Great Outdoor Reset? I think we can all agree that during this time of COVID pandemic, there's been an acceleration in interest in the outdoors. Folks want to get away from their computers, away from Zoom, and out into nature. But there's also been a spotlight and a recognition on the fragility of nature. Certainly each one of us now knows what's happening in terms of global warming and climate change. We've seen species continue to be threatened each and every year, and we're losing species uh, by the rate of about 30 each year. So thinking about humanity's interaction with nature and what can we do to boost natural systems this is a time, I think, of the great outdoor reset, where people are taking stock not only, not only in their interest in the fun in the outdoors, but also in terms of what they can give back. The outdoor citizen in that regard is a very simple premise. To be an outdoor citizen, you're active in the outdoors, and you also recognize your responsibility as a conservation steward. So be active in the outdoors and be a conservation steward. And outdoor citizenship is open to everybody. So everyone can be an outdoor citizen. Uh, it's apropos for me to start with AMC or the Appalachian Mountain Club. AMC is America's oldest conservation and outdoors organization. We were founded in 1876. And now we have well over 300,000 members, participants, guests, and supporters. We have 12 chapters around the region from Maine uh, to Virginia. And we have about 100 overnight uh, facilities. So we run a very robust eco-lodging hospitality business, everything from backcountry shelters and tent campsites to front country lodges uh, in private rooms and private cabins. We also do a quite a bit of trail maintenance, 2,000 miles of trail building and maintenance. And we work to get uh, tens of thousands of people outdoors every year, including um, tens of thousands of young people. Here is Carter Notch Hut. You can see the snow around it in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. AMC has eight high mountain huts. The first one was built in 1888. Uh, that was called Madison Springs Hut. And it's a beautiful uh, spot uh, right at uh, Mount Madison and Mount Adams. And in 1888, when it was uh, being finished, Roswell Bigelow Lawrence, then the treasurer of AMC's board of directors, decided he wanted to be the first one to stay overnight in the hut. So in the winter of 1888, February of 1888, he and a friend decided to head up there. They took a train right up to the New Hampshire border. They took a snow coach from there to the trailhead, and then they hiked up to Madison Hut. When they got there, the hut was fully encased in rime ice, so they had to chip that off. And then when they got inside, they realized that the hut had not been finished. The construction hadn't been finished. Uh, thankfully, the, the fireplace and the chimney had been finished. So they started a fire, they cooked chicken fricassee, they hung their hammocks and they stayed the night. And the next day, Roswell wrote in his diary about how he had hoped that this would be the start of something amazing, uh, many, many people's journeys over the coming decades. And he was right. Uh, it has been. Uh, nearly 45,000 folks stay over in the huts uh, every summer. But when you think about Roswell's story, it's one of personal goal setting and achievement. And those things are synonymous with AMC members. They set personal goals and they set out to uh, achieve those goals. That will be important as we think about the idea of outdoor citizenship and what it means to create your own journey or path or trailway in terms of goals and achievement uh, in life to be active in the outdoors and to be active in conservation stewardship. Uh, nothing says AMC like uh, the trail work that we do. Again, we maintain about 2000 miles of trails uh, all around the region, including 350 miles of the Appalachian Trail. And that partnership is with the ATC or the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. AMC was one of the founders of the ACC uh, back in the uh, late 1920s. 
And when, when I think about that partnership, working together in collaboration, maintaining the trail, it very much has been the foundational piece, this idea of collaboration that we need more of in this world around conservation stewardship. We can't go it alone. We can't do it alone. But when we collaborate and get together, many great things can happen. So that Appalachian Trail Conservancy partnership that we have, the partnership that the AMC has in the White Mountain National Forest around our huts and our lodges, it's an idea of public-private partnerships and partnerships and collaboration that we need to foster more of in this world. Leadership training is also a big part of AMC. Safety is job one for us, but everything from Mountain Leadership School, where we're uh, training uh, summer um, staff at uh, summer camps uh, to be uh, better leaders, or we're doing something called the Outdoor Leadership Training for teachers and youth workers, where they get trained uh, by us over the course of three to five days. And when they finish that training, they get unlimited free use of our 11 gear uh, lending libraries. So for kids, it's the great equalizer. You know, every pair of boots that we lend out gets used about 50 times uh, during the year. So leadership training is a big part of what we're doing at AMC but it speaks to the need for preparedness in the outdoors. You never know what's going to come at you uh, when you're in the outdoors. So you need to be prepared. So leadership training is key. One of the things I'm most proud about this past year has been AMC's work on the Land Water Conservation Fund. And the Great American Outdoors Act was passed in August of 2020. And in the Great American Outdoors Act, the biggest part was the reauthorization and reappropriation of the Land Water Conservation Fund. That means $900 million a year coming to communities all across the United States for uh, land, acquisi land acquisition, conservation protection, uh, funding memorials and, and ballparks. Uh, but the Land Water Conservation Fund, that funding from uh, the United States is going to be so important. And many states match that uh, funding as well. So in some cases, you're talking about much, much more than the $900 million, but every county in the United States has benefited from those LWCF funds from the start. So we're excited to see how, that's get, get, how that gets distributed and used around the country. Uh, my background, I've been a CEO uh, since January of uh, 2012. Prior to this, I was the uh, chief of economic development and planning uh, for the city of Springfield. And then before that, I uh, was the executive director of the Greater Boston Affiliate at Habitat for Humanity. But I give credit for my interest in the outdoors and conservation to my dad. He was a true conservation uh, advocate and uh, reveled in being in the outdoors. He grew up in a uh, tenement house in the uh, city of uh, Attleboro, uh, Massachusetts, and went on to join the Marine Corps. When he um, got out of the Marine Corps, he got into Rhode Island School of Design, where thanks to the GI Bill, uh, he got a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture and then went on to become a horticulturalist as well. But the ethic of conservation was very much instilled in my sisters and I. And for my parents, there was nothing better for them to say, you know, get out of the house, uh, turn off the TV, you know, stop um, all the commotion inside the house and get outdoors. And we very much would escape outdoors to this little strip of conservation land that was behind our house uh, that we called the woods. And it was an oasis for us, a place for us to uh, just, again, escape, but also discover uh, nature and everything from, you know, building forts uh, to the composting that we did back there as a family uh, to the garden that we grew in our backyard, to the recycling that we did. Uh, that conservation ethic uh, has stayed with me uh, from my childhood. And I think about that uh, in terms of how I'm uh, raising, my wife and I are raising our four-year-old daughter and how she is connected with the outdoors. Uh, when we get outside, she says to us that she's going into nature so she really has a early appreciation for it. 
One of the struggles we all have, of course, are the challenges that are going around around the world. These challenges or barriers to us getting into the outdoors and certainly like my daughter's generation and generations to come, these are going to be more and more acute in terms of these challenges. Technology overload, of course, these young people are spending upwards of seven hours a day in front of video screens, climate change, what we'll talk about in a second. And then many organizations, many um, nonprofit uh, clubs, conservation related organizations have been very discriminatory uh, over the years. So this idea of conservation elitism, um, the access and equity, uh, and then the ability to certainly uh, model uh, better behavior that all needs to happen in the environmental sector and the conservation sector. So we're trying to make great strides in terms of our diversity, equity, and inclusion work and make sure that everybody has access to the outdoors. So we'll be doing a number of exciting things uh, in 2021 and beyond, including applying for a national AmeriCorps uh, program. So that will be 40 uh, AmeriCorps spaces to try to get young people into the benefit of an outdoor career, specifically focused on trail building, but hopefully expanding that. When it comes to climate change, all of us can agree that climate change is real. Um, I had a, a meeting recently with the CEO of a company in Boston, Mass., and we met for about an hour and he told me, you know, why are you talking about climate change, that he didn't believe in climate change. And in the same breath, as we finished the meeting after about an hour, he turned to me and said he was signing up a broker to sell his house in the Florida Keys. And I said to him, you know, why are you selling your home in the Florida Keys? And he said, are you kidding? With sea level rise, I've got to get out of there. So it's an interesting story because it shows you that while some people might not believe climate change is real, they certainly believe in global warming and sea level rise and extreme weather events. And we need to get everyone on board in terms of combating extreme weather events, combating uh, the rise in, in global temperature, wherever they come from, wherever they are, we've got to meet them there and bring them along and get them involved in the fight against climate change. This is a juxtaposition of a photo from 1890 and a photo from uh, 2018, but you can see the difference in terms of the snow uh, melt. Vittorio Sella, who is a member of AMC, a uh, famous uh, Italian photographer, was an honorary member of AMC in the late 1800s, uh, bequest to us uh, hundreds and hundreds of photos. But uh, this one compared to uh, today's uh, reality shows you the stark difference. In terms of ex extreme weather events, at AMC, we're doing a lot of conservation research, including alpine zone research measuring the changing weathers. And one of the things that we found is that since 1917, we've been losing days of winter. In fact, now it's about three weeks shorter than a century ago. Winter is about three weeks shorter, 19 days shorter than it was a century ago. Alpine zone changes are happening, of course, because of this weather, and then species are migrating. That's why we're seeing a lot of uh, insect uh, migration in certain areas that hadn't had that kind of uh, devastation, um, places like Colorado. And then in terms of extreme weather events, the Northeast is experiencing 38% more frequency of heavy pre precipitation events. But thinking about what's happening all around the world, whether it be hurricanes or droughts, the extremes are what many people are calling whiplash weather. So, why outdoor citizen? Uh, we really need to have a global community of outdoor citizens engage in the outdoors at every level. Uh, so from an outdoor recreational standpoint, but certainly from a climate change and conservation stewardship standpoint, we need the citizens to speak up and engage in a new and bold way, not only for the health of our planet, but the health for all of us as individuals, right? So being active in the outdoors and being conservation stewards, again, of the two pillars of outdoor citizenship. So in order to really move the needle uh, and get more folks involved in the outdoors, we have to figure out how to connect with cities. And this is the concept of the outdoor city. 
We live in a world of cities. By 2050, by 2050, 70% of the world will be living in urban areas. And while that's good in many ways, because folks will have more of a density in terms of where they're living and less of a carbon footprint in that regard, we have to ask ourselves, what is their connection to nature and the outdoors going to be? And then what is their role in terms of conservation stewardship when they might not have a park within 10 minutes or 15 minutes of them, or when they might not have a walking trail or cycling trail nearby? So green planning for cities and for communities has been going on for a long time. Uh, these are some diagrams from the UK uh, back at the turn of the last century. And our idea of outdoor city, again, has four uh, simple buckets. Uh, the idea of an outdoor journey or pathway, uh, the idea of programs and connections, for instance, uh, it could be apps or other programs that a city puts on, or it could be with a third party that comes in and runs something at a park for you. Uh, on the design and the development side of things, it's connecting not only the outdoor recreational infrastructure, but it's also bringing the resiliency infrastructure into play as well. So it's nature system services, everything from wetlands to what we call resilient trails, bringing them into the mix. So cities not only have more to offer in terms of their citizens, but they're better prepared for extreme weather events. And they're also better in terms of carbon sequestering and getting clean air out. Um, and then the last piece is this idea of global sharing. We've got to share best practices you know, for one city to do something extremely well, uh, that's terrific for them, but we need to spread that idea around the world and make sure that we're sharing best practices. So these are the three pieces of outdoor citizenship, the recreational piece, the idea of an outdoor journey, and then the conservation stewardship. At AMC, we very much believe recreation is the secret sauce or the fun that gets people to conservation stewardship. In terms of an outdoor city, many things are pointing to why we're going to have a era of outdoor cities. Now, uh, certainly on the data collection side of things, everything from our, our cell phones and our mobile phones, what they're doing to help us collect data. We'll talk a little bit about citizen science coming up. Our health, the idea of active transit, where people are now looking for cities that have better quality of life and access to bike lanes and walking trails. Uh, the focus on, in terms of investment uh, from a consumer side, again, this is the idea of the individual driving uh, their investment managers and uh, the folks from the Fidelities uh, and the Wellingtons of the world and the Wall Street corporations, pushing them to do more on ESG, environmental, social, and governance investing and more on impact investing, more for the climate and more for the world. Uh, last year, for instance, in the, first, in the first nine months of 2020, there was a 96% increase in the number of green bonds issued. So environmental bonds that were issued around the world, there was a 96% increase. And that's because consumers and institutional folks are pushing for Wall Street and investment to do more in the outdoors. So that that equated to over $350 billion worth of green bonds. So obviously we need to see a lot more of that. And then in terms of opportunities, these are some things that are happening um, in terms of building materials for the cities of the future. People are getting away, for instance, from concrete. Concrete is responsible for about 8% of our greenhouse gases. So folks are looking to wood and other uh, building materials. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, opportunities, what I call move, uh, movement to the edge in terms of energy innovation. Uh, so more communities are not only going to be figuring out ways to lower their carbon footprint, but they're also going to be looking for ways to create their own energy, to have their own renewable energy right there uh, close to home. And then, of course, we've got opportunities in terms of the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. But we also have opportunities in what I like to call the next ecology, this idea of bringing a much more robust science to the, the tending of natural systems, especially in cities. 
where they're in, in, in dire need of, of help. So a smart city is an outdoor city. I know many of you have heard about smart cities. Certainly as a city planner, it was always the big watchwords for us, smart city. But thinking about what some cities are doing around the world, New Songdo City in South Korea, here's an example of what they did. They are a smart city from, from day one where they created all kinds of terrific uh, digital systems that underpin their smart city. But they also made sure that they were an outdoor city. So they had access to green space for all their residents and they use natural system services to help in terms of carbon so sequestration and generating great oxygen and lowering heat island effect. Here's another example from China. In China, there are 30 of these uh, cities, they call them sponge cities. So 30 cities basically plan to absorb upwards of 70% of their groundwater runoff. And as you can see, it's a, it's a gorgeous area for recreation. And then this is one of my favorites. My brother and sister-in-law live in Singapore, but this is the Gardens by the Bay Park in Singapore. And these uh, trees, these artificial trees are 150 foot high and they're, they're solar arrays inside. So they, they power the park. And then down below, there's a carpet of uh, vegetation, about 150,000 uh, varieties of trees and plants uh, below. So it's, it's a great example of, of bringing technology in to support the natural world. So some of the things, on we talked a little bit about the app side of things and the program side of things. Amsterdam came up with their own interactive uh, map um, through a company called Urban Nature. In the United States, we've got apps like All Trails and Chimani uh, that are doing a number of things to get people in the outdoors. But one of the fun things they're doing is they're gamifying uh, these outdoor apps. So like we talked about Roswell B. Lawrence heading up to Madison Spring Hut in his uh, personal goal setting and achievement uh, setting. Uh, these apps gamify that goal setting and really push people to achieve more. The iNaturals program is a program that we're working with uh, National Geographic on. And it, it's a real remarkable program because you use your, your mobile phone to go out and, and be active in terms of your identification of species and phenological changes. Uh, you know, they have an example of a butterfly here, someone taking a picture of a butterfly and then sending in uh, that data. But there's this aggregation of data from around the world that's happening through iNaturalist. It's also helping us with that snow uh, pack. Uh, and you'll learn more about that in years to come as we start doing more in terms of identifying the disappearing winters, trying to figure out where the extreme weather events are happening and affecting winters. This is another example of citizen scientists, uh, citizen science that we're doing or community science. It's called the Dragonfly Mercury Project. We're training folks to go out and scoop up dragonfly eggs. It's now in a hundred parks. Uh, it's being run um, by a couple of folks, including our director of conservation research, Dr. Sarah Nelson. So it's a wonderful way for people to get involved. And then it's a terrific uh, data, many data points to show us where mer mercury poisoning is happening. So one of the moves moving forward, and there are many things, and obviously I don't have a heck of a lot of time during this pres presentation to cover everything, but I wanted to talk a little bit about reforestation and having each one of us be um, our own, uh, you know, Johnny Appleseeds in terms of going out and thinking about how we're planting for us and supporting for us. But McKinsey and company just came out with a study and it was talking about if we're going to move the needle on carbon sequestering, uh, if we're going to move the needle and really have the best possibility of sinking carbon and storing carbon, it's planting 740 million acres of forest by 2050. And 740 million acres of forest, that's about a third of the size of the continental United States. So it's a, it's a massive, audacious goal, but we need to get there. We talked a little bit about uh, trees and the work of using technology to support uh, trees in cities in particular. Trees in urban areas live half the time of trees in wilderness or rural areas. So you can think about all the things that happen to trees, whether it be a moving truck 
uh, knocking in the back of a tree or uh, black topping over roots. Trees really get uh, a very hard uh, life in urban areas. So we need to step up and do more as outdoor citizens and support that canopy of trees and cities. Certainly technology is a, playing a big role. This idea of a tree inventory that's happening in many cities now, it's exciting and, and leveraging citizen science. So people are going out and helping with these tree inventories. There's also a movement in cities now, including in Japan, to create micro forests or mini forests inside cities. In Japan, they're doing something where they're creating forests essentially the size of a basketball court uh, in these mini pocket park uh, areas around the city. Uh, in places like uh, New York City, they're doing a great job planting trees. They've got a million tree goal in New York. I go to nature to be soothed, healed, and to have my senses put in order, John Burroughs. One of the things, while we talk about the sequestering ability and the tree being the ultimate carbon sink uh, that we have on the planet, the most uh, natural carbon sink that we have, when you get out in the trees, uh, you, you don't lose the, the awe factor. I, I never do when working, uh, walking under a canopy of trees. It's, it's almost like a cathedral. And the restorative power of nature uh, is certainly front and center uh, as you're walking along. But when you're out, outdoors, take a deep breath, take it all in, uh, look around, identify uh, something new, and, and really appreciate uh, the majesty of, of trees. One of the things we're doing in terms of trees and protecting the outdoors, a project I'm very proud of that started uh, around uh, 2003, 2004, is called the Maine Woods Initiative. And we've been uh, assembling and protecting uh, land on a landscape scale uh, since 2003, uh, again, called the Maine Woods. It's up by Moosehead Lake. And we have about 75,000 acres now. We're working to, to acquire another 26,000 acres. So it will bring it up to over 100,000 acres. And when you think about this Maine Woods Initiative, one of the things I'm most proud about is that it's a world-class model. Not only are we doing sustainable forestry, but we have a very big lodging operation with three eco lodges. And then we have about 100 miles of trails. These are some of the trails, cross-country trails, hiking trails, gravel biking uh, trails. We're doing a lot of work uh, in terms of land management and conservation restoration. We're removing culverts like this and turning it into this. So you can see that it's absolutely gorgeous, these streams that are restored. We've restored about 86 of them right now. And for the first time in 150 years, Atlantic salmon are coming back to the area. Here's some uh, salmon work that happened in the winter of uh, 2020. So in summary, we need a worldwide movement of outdoor citizenship to connect folks all over the world with nature and to have each of us step up and really become conservation stewards. We live in a time where we think about nature and we think about resource extraction. What are we getting from nature? Uh, we need to be changing that, pivoting to a new paradigm of what are we giving back to nature? Um, so to be successful, in, in moving the needle again, we need to galvanize cities in a new way. In a world of cities, we need to make sure that cities are connected with nature and every resident in the city has equal access and accessibility to the great parks and trails uh, in the natural world. And then on the policy stand front, outdoor citizens now have, because of their mobile devices and technology, they have an incredible voice to speak up on the policy realm. We talked about the Great American Outdoors Act. The reason that act passed was because so many people picked up the phone and called their member of Congress or their senator or wrote a, wrote a letter or sent an email. It was a groundswell of support. We had over 1,100 organizations in the National Coalition for the Reauthorization of the Land Water Conservation Fund that AMC was one of the leaders of. So it's citizens speaking up, and now we have the tools to do that even more, whether it be galvanizing our voices or mobilizing 
uh, around a policy idea, environmental conservation stewardship or outdoor recreation, this is the time to speak up and really be outdoor citizens. So thank you. Thanks for taking all of this time and please get into the outdoors. Take care.